welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene, Wheels of Terror edition. I'm your host, Joe Hollywood, and I'm joined by Imagine Host Pete. Hey, hey. And as always, Andrew. Uh, I didn't think of a nickname this time. <laughs> Mad Wheels. Mad, Mad, Mad Wheels. Uh, dead End Walker. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. And so, yeah, this is a uh, this is a topic I'm surprised we haven't tackled before. Uh, what we're going to talk about today are uh, tragic accidents uh, involving car crashes and things like that. And uh, doing research on this topic, there is a shocking long list uh, of, of tragic accidents that have taken the lives. Yeah, of if stars. you're a celebrity, don't drive. Don't fly. <laughs> Maybe just walk or have people come you visit know, you. You know, it's interesting as uh, once uh, a person becomes president of the United States, they're not allowed to drive the rest of their, of their life. Did you All know right. that? No. I, I mean, that's not surprising because they get a Secret Service detail. They get the Secret Service life. detail, and they want to make sure that nothing is, you know, or try to cut down on any sort of accidents. Oh, good. Yeah, I remember when uh, Jerry Seinfeld uh, visited the White House when Obama was still in office, and uh, I, they did a little bit of driving on the campus. I believe Obama did some driving on the White House campus, but they were not allowed to leave the grounds. And Jerry's like, "Come on, you're the president!" And he's, "Nah, can't, can't do that." Is that for his uh, Netflix show? Yeah, the yeah. comedians and cars. If you haven't seen the Obama episode, it's hysterical. I've, I've seen a couple episodes. It's pretty good. Yeah, so... I know um, Tiger Woods tried to join this club a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God he didn't. Well, that's right. Uh, all right, so my first car I have lined up is uh, probably one of the most famous celebrity deaths, car crashes in history. Um, this actor uh, really broke out. He had done some television work, but then he really broke out in his first major film role called East of Eden. Uh, it was released in 1955. Uh, that same year, he uh, filmed Rebel Without a Cause and Giant, uh, which uh, had uh, not been released yet. Of course, you know I'm talking about James Dean. Uh, who grew up in Fairmount, Indiana before make I think he spent some time in New York working on the stage before he ended up in L.A. doing movies. Uh, in addition to uh, being a movie star and an actor, who many consider one of the greatest actors of all time, sure. uh, he also was a racing enthusiast. And at one time he had like a, a speedster uh, that he would tool around in. He had dabbled in some racing uh, while he was filming, he wasn't allowed to take part in that because, you know, the studio obligations. Right. Um, but when the production of Giant came to an end, uh, he had registered for the Salinas Road Race, scheduled for October 1st and 2nd, 1955. He had purchased a 1955 Porsche 550 Spider. And you've probably seen pictures of it, beautiful silver Porsche. Uh, oh, yeah. With the uh, numbers on the side and little bastard on the uh, the back. Uh, there's been some discussion as to who detailed the car. I believe it was Dean Jeffries who also built the Monkey Mobile and, and uh, the Black Beauty from Green Hornet. Uh, George Barris took some uh, claim on that. Yeah, he was an acquaintance, a friend of, uh, of James Dean. Uh, I believe both guys said, don't drive the car to the race, trailer it. Um, this is this is a really powerful car. You're driving it for the first time. You really should race it or, or uh, you should trailer it to the race. Uh, unfortunately, his his German mechanic said, well, you need to break it in for the race. You got to you got to put some miles on it. And so he talked James Dean into driving the Porsche uh, through the desert to the race. Uh, so on September 30th, 1955, uh, Dean and his German mechanic, Rolf Wutherick, uh, jumped into the convertible. There's some uh, famous photos. There was a photographer who tooled along named Sanford uh, Roth. He took some photos of them 
uh, stopping at a gas station, and you see some pictures of those two in the car. Uh, they were also joined uh, by stunt coordinator Bill Hickman, who was in another car. So they had a little bit of a caravan uh, going out there. And uh, the whole caravan got pulled over, uh, and uh, I think at least a couple of the cars got a speeding ticket around 3.30 that afternoon. And you could find pictures of the speeding ticket online. Uh, so the group was on their way to this racetrack. Uh, they were driving on U.S. Route 466 near Sholam, uh, California, at approximately 5.45 a 1950 Ford two-door driven by 23-year-old student Donald Turnipseed uh, decided to make a left turn onto Highway 41 right in front of the Porsche that was uh, reportedly driving at a pretty high rate of speed. There's some discussion about that we'll get into in a second. Uh, so as the car turned, uh, it's reportedly said that James Dean said to his mechanic, oh, he sees us, he's, he's not, and then he turned in front of him, and Dean just hit him right in the passenger side. The mechanic uh, was ejected from the car and survived, even though he had serious, serious injuries. Uh, but Dean was found trapped inside the crumpled wreck uh, with a broken neck. Uh, there were several witnesses who stopped to try and offer assistance. One of them was a nurse who uh, originally claimed that she felt a faint pulse in uh, James Dean. Uh, eventually he was taken away by ambulance, arrived at the uh, hospital and was declared dead on arrival. Uh, Turnipseed, who turned in front of the car, had just minor injuries. And, um, and the interesting thing is, is that this Turnipseed apparently wasn't blamed for the accident. I believe the sun was setting behind James Dean and the Porsche, which kind of obscured uh, the view of the car, this shiny little car with the sun setting behind it. Um, when they did an accident investigation, they said that James Dean's speed was a factor. Uh, but what some people say is that when, when you're a race car driver and you know something unfolds around you, uh, you try to find an opening, you hit the gas and try to blow past it. I remember doing that with a deer that had stepped out on the freeway in front of me and you don't slam on your brakes. You try to pick a lane and can go, yeah. hopefully, and you pick the right lane. So that's what some experts say is that when the car started to turn, he tried to beat it by accelerating, um, but instead he was blamed for the accident. He was only 24 years old. There are monuments uh, at the location. Uh, now, original, originally being from Fairmount, Indiana, the uh, funeral service was held there, and that's where he's buried in Park Cemetery in Fairmount. His uh, tombstone was stolen once, had to be replaced. They eventually found it, but it's like, who steals a tombstone? Like, if you're a fan, how do you disrespect someone uh, by stealing their tombstone? And if you're not, if you're going to hawk it, how yeah. Do you, how do you how do you fence something you like put, that? Or do you just put it in your living room and stare yeah. at it? I don't know. It's crazy. I'm sure Frank, alcohol is, that, is, is that, involved. Is that Dean Martin? <laughs> is that Dean? <laughs> now, following his death, uh, now keep in mind, you know, he the the sixty eighth anniversary of this accident is just in a few days, and so after his death, Rebel Without a Cause was released on October twenty seventh, just about a month later. And teenagers just reacted to the film. They sent fan letters to the studio. I don't know if they were aware that he had passed away or not, but uh, he became even larger than he was in life because the movie was released posthumously. Uh, and then Giant was released about a year later, on November 24th, 1956. Uh, that starred Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson, and, and Dean had a bit of a minor role in that. Um, and so he only did those three movies, and we still talk about him today, which is so crazy. At, at that time, did fans say, oh, look, I get the Rebel Without a Cause coming right after he died. But a year later, Giant comes out, he's not really dead. Exactly. Oh, they, no, so I, no that, I'm sure happen? there was oh. that. I mean, you know, when you look at, like, Elvis and stuff, there's always that faction that's like, they can't accept the fact that they died, so... Oh, there's, he was spotted in Kalamazoo, Michigan, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm sure there's people out there who said he faked his death to escape fame and all that stuff. Um, now, in 2002, I was going to Indianapolis uh, for to accept an award, not to toot my own horn, but 
beep, beep. Um, and my buddy Dennis was coming along, and he said, hey, I have to deliver some DVDs to the James Dean Museum. And uh, he said, can we stop on the way? I said, oh, my God, that'd be awesome. So we stopped in Fairmount, Indiana, and I had the tour of all tours. Uh, we met James Dean's cousin, and he invited us into his childhood home. Uh, and there's a barn there that has uh, little Jimmy Dean's signature, and I think his handprint. And I think, Andrew, I was telling you the story. Uh, they were concerned about farm equipment driving over the uh, the imprint and the cement, so they hired a company to relocate it to a, a less well-traveled area of the barn. And in the process of moving it, they broke it right in half. Of course. Just of course lit they did. right down the middle. You'd rather just have tractors drive over it. Um, so I can only imagine the reaction of the cousin as he uh, watched that piece of cement crack in half. Uh, but they did ro- relocate it, and I got to see it with the big crack in it. Um, so in addition to being in his childhood home and, and seeing that property, uh, the cousin took us over to a nondescript building that looked like it could have been a insurance business or something. He unlocks the door and we go in there and it's full of artifacts and mementos. And I remember there was this uh, maroon kind of a burgundy Ford that was in the building. And the cousins uh, said, uh, do you want to sit in it? I said, yeah, sure. So he opens the door. I sit behind the wheel and close the door. Um, his name is Marcus, I believe, the cousin. And I said, what's the significance of this car? And he said, James Dean took it to prom. And so I'm sitting in a car that huh. James Dean took wow. to prom. That's uh, pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, we visited his, his school, which had been closed at the time. People were taking bricks out of the facade as souvenirs. It was closed to the public. So people were like, I'm going to help myself to a brick from James Dean's school. Which, um, again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they've demolished it since, but if they did demolish it, I kind of wish I would have taken a brick. Sir, that's a support beam. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's a load-bearing yeah. brick. Uh, so that was a tour of a lifetime. Now, I don't know if you've ever read, there's been some crazy rumors following the accident about the car being cursed. Have you ever heard about this? No, uh, I have not. The number on the car that was painted on the car was 130. And a lot of people said, oh, putting 13 on the side of the car is not a good idea. But it's not 13, it's 130. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was 130, <laughs> but 13 three, and then the zero. So, so here's the deal. So after the accident, uh, notorious embellisher, um, uh, George, uh, uh, George Barris, who built the original Batmobile and Munster's coach and other famous cars. Uh, he claimed, uh, immediately after the accident that he had bought the wreckage from the Dean family. Oh. And he started sharing all these stories about how, uh, the engine from the car was put into another car and that car crashed and killed the driver. And, <laughs> and the axle, uh, when it was up on a lift, something fell off and crushed another man's legs. And when it went on a safety tour to school as a student was crushed by, and I'm like, this is insane. Well, in the process of doing research for this story, I found out that a lot of that is bullshit. And, <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. And <laughs> it, it ticks me off because George Bears, who I love, I've met several times, but he was, uh, a, he would embellish things. If somebody credited him with making a car he didn't make, he would, wouldn't contradict him. He's like, okay, sure, whatever. If you put a, a picture of a car in front of him that he had nothing to do with, he'd sign it. Yeah, yeah. So I read one article earlier today that said, more than likely, the car that George Bears had taken on this uh, safety tour was just a big piece of aluminum that was kind of hammered into uh, a shape resembling a Porsche and was crumpled and damaged and passed off as James Dean's Porsche. Now, the story concludes, at least that part of the story, concludes with George Bears claiming that as the the shell of the car was being transported in a truck on this tour that the driver of the truck claims that 
from as he was going from one location to another location, he had loaded up the car, arrived at his destination, got out, went around to the back of the truck, opened up the door, and it was gone. And everyone was like, so was it stolen in motion? Like, how would someone steal the car? And so there's always been some speculation. Where is James Dean's car today? Where it's got to be in someone's private collection today. Again, doing my research today, this is what I discovered, that more than likely uh, there was a guy, his name was in the article, I didn't write it down, who had purchased the remains of the James Dean car, did repurpose the engine and and parts of the car, and then destroyed the body and the rest of the car. Hmm. And that, I think, is a more logical, simple explanation of what happened to the car than these ghost, phantom, disappearing tales and curses and stuff like that. So credit George Barris with all these crazy rumors, but in reality, it's a lot more... Boring and simple than that. So I have three quick things. First one, <laughs> excellent humble brag about yeah. you going to receive an award. Can't let that go by. Number I squeezed a couple of good brags in there. There you yeah. go. Number two, on this one, when he said when that uh, when that uh, driver, that truck driver, was saying that, oh, I, I hitched up and I and it wasn't there. Maybe he just forgot to hitch it up properly. It rolled <laughs> off. He said, oh my god, it fell off. I'm going to make up a story that it was stolen. Everyone's going to be like, oh yeah, that's probably more likely. Maybe the guy just forgot to hitch it on and. Yeah. Made it left, and oh, there it goes. Can you imagine the shell of James Dean's car in the desert someplace? <laughs> and then the third one, he's, the name of the young man who was driving the car. Turnip Seed. Turnip Seed. Did anyone, did he change his last name? Because <laughs> would you want to turn, Turnip Seed, why is the name? Did your granddad kill James? Right. Actually, he never changed his name, but as you can imagine, he was contacted for interviews and just refused to discuss it, would not allow it to be brought up. You could imagine the things that people said to him. Yeah. You killed James Dean. Imagine having to live with that. And he just died only recently. Like okay. within the last few years, he died. Because I was about to say, in most other traffic cases, when you pull into the onto an onto a highway, you're at fault. Yeah, because you got to have give the right away. There's yeah, he turned back. right in front of him. So he he's to blame for this, and uh, he had to live with that his entire life. So. That's a shame. But, yeah, so that's one of Yikes. the most famous car accidents. And uh, one of these days I might get out to that crash location and uh, and pay my respects. But, uh, yeah, pretty pretty crazy story. Uh, next up, I have another pretty famous vehicle that uh, basically is uh, evidence in a crime, I guess. Uh, so there's a woman you may not have heard of. Her name is, is Ruth Warren of Topeka, Kansas. Ring a bell with anybody? No. 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 <laughs> oh, Aunt Ruth. Yeah. Ruth, Ruth Warren. <laughs> yeah. I know Ruth. Uh, Not the candy bar. Way back in 1934, she purchased a Cordoba Gray 1934 Ford Model 730 Deluxe Sedan. Most people call it uh, 1934 Ford V8 because it had a 85 horsepower V8 engine. Uh, built in River Rouge. Mm. All right. Yeah. Uh, she paid a whopping $835 for this brand new uh, Ford V8. Uh, at one point, Ruth took it out. I think her and her husband only had put maybe a, around 1,000 miles on it, if that. Uh, Ruth went out for a short drive, parked the car in the driveway with the keys in the ignition. And she was in the kitchen doing something, looked out the window and said, Hey, my car's gone. <laughs> Uh, so she filed a police report, and uh, they couldn't figure out what had happened. Uh, I guess you shouldn't have left your keys in it. Uh, turns out the car was stolen by Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, boy. On April 29th, 1934. Witnesses said that they saw a car kind of slowly drive by, sort of circled the block, and when the car came back, there was a man riding on the what do you call that? Like the step of the car, the the runner, I guess. And the car stopped in front of the Ford. The guy in the runner jumped out, hopped in, turned the key, and took off in the Ford. And that was uh, Clyde Barrow. Uh, it's it's kind of famous. And if you've ever visited the Henry Ford Museum, there's a letter on display from Clyde Barrow praising Henry Ford and his Ford products. He loved Ford cars. So that's one of a few things that him and I have in common. Dear Mr. Barrow, stop. Your <laughs> consistent praise of this, our product is uh, encouraging, but please stop contacting <laughs> We'll use this in our prints. Yeah. 
Uh, so in the uh, in the month or so that uh, Clyde owned this car and had swapped the plates out, <laughs> he had put seventy five hundred miles on the car in twenty five days. And I, and I Whoa. didn't I didn't look up to see if he had committed crimes in this car. I'm going to have to double check. But in twenty five days, seventy five hundred miles. Yeah, exactly. So Lord, uh, usually got, takes me uh, about six months. To <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he had some fun with this Ford. That's and a damn good car. <laughs> I, I read a quote online that said, "I don't think he ever legally purchased any of his cars," which is hilarious. <laughs> Uh, so let's fast forward, uh, about a month, uh, later in May or the car was stolen in April, uh, in May, uh, four members of a posse from Texas were down in Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, hunting for Bonnie and Clyde who had committed, you know, numerous murders of law enforcement and bank robberies and things like that. So they wanted to bring that to an end. Uh, they learned that Bonnie and Clyde were planning to visit, uh, a friend or a relative named uh, Ivy Methvin uh, on uh, that evening. And so they, apparently, I think they had reached out to this person and had agreed, the person had agreed to park their truck on the shoulder of the road that led to his property, hoping to catch the eye of, of Clyde Barrow as they approached. So uh, this posse and a couple other uh, law enforcement people all laid in wait uh, along the road, and it was the Louisiana State Highway 154 to south of Gibsland. And at 9.50 a.m. on May 23rd, as they were hiding in the bushes, waiting and waiting and just about ready to give up, uh, they hear a car approaching. Um, and as the car approaches, they see Clyde Barrow behind the, uh, the wheel of the car. Uh, so as the car slowed down to investigate the truck is exactly what they had hoped. They unleashed, they came out of the bushes <laughs> with pistols and rifles and shotguns and, uh, emptied their weapons <laughs> and the car never actually came to a complete stop. And so they just kept unleashing and it rolled into a ditch and then finally came to a stop. And they continued to <laughs> unload their weapons after the car had finally come to a stop in a ditch. And when they investigated, they basically discovered that Clyde had been shot in the head with, like, one of the first shots. And uh, and both of them were just riddled with bodies or, or with bullets. And so the final count was 112 bullet holes in the car. <laughs> And when they started uh, searching the car, they found an arsenal of weapons of all kinds. And word got out pretty quickly. And a crowd started to gather and started collecting souvenirs. They were taking pieces of the car, wow. uh, cutting off pieces of clothing from Bonnie and Clyde. Someone cut a lock of hair Oof. off of Bonnie. And Protect the crime scene, gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you said it wasn't just a posse. There were law enforcement. There were like FBI. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, were... and they were just like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I think <laughs> they were trying to, but they they got like overwhelmed. Oh, okay. They if they spared a couple of bullets, they could have shot a couple <laughs> into the air, to just disperse the crowd. <laughs> one of the more gruesome details is they stopped one guy from trying to cut off uh, Clyde's trigger finger, Ugh. and another person was stopped uh, as he was trying to remove Clyde's ear. Uh, so imagine people trying to take body parts as souvenirs. Uh, that's absolutely insane to me. But that that's the, that happened in the 30s, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that's the equivalent today but... of... of... People stalking uh, pop stars now and like, mm -hmm. so, oh, he's trying to get something off of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, if like if Taylor Swift died in a public area, and, and there were fans around, you know, oh, yeah. something really messed up. This was oh, the bar sure. soap that you, Taylor Swift used in her last hotel night. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's uh, nuts. She walked away from this half-eaten sandwich. Uh, <laughs> I'm putting it on eBay. Oh that's God. celebrity culture at its worst. So uh, been going on since the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ruth Warren, who originally owned the car, uh, when she learned about it, traveled to Louisiana to claim her car. She met with Sheriff Henderson Jordan, who refused to release it to her, saying that she would have to pay $15,000 to get her car back. Uh, she hired an attorney, sued the sheriff, 
the judge said, uh, give her her car back or you will be sent to jail. He said this to the sheriff. Sheriff said, ah, here's the keys. I, I wondered where I had forgotten to put these. So, uh, so she got her car back and she, <laughs> imagine Ruth Warren drove the car, the blood-stained, bullet-riddled car to Shreveport where then she had it loaded onto a truck to get transported back to Topeka, Kansas, where she lived. And it sat in her driveway for several days. And it was just damage from the souvenir hunters and all that stuff. Ruth, I don't mean to be a pickle, but <laughs> is there something wrong with your car, honey? <laughs> it's been sitting in your driveway. It's a bit of an eyesore. <laughs> yeah. there's. Uh, Are there's... You, I can patch that up for you if you want. <laughs> I know the problem. Yeah, that's hilarious. Um, so her husband was like, I don't want that sitting in our driveway. So, Okay, um, some common sense finally. Yeah. So Ruth, who began to realize the value of the car, she started leasing it to various shows and, you know, exhibitions. Right. Uh, John Castle of United Shows exhibited the car at the Topeka Fairgrounds. Uh, until he uh, didn't make good on the uh, rental fee, so it got repossessed from him. And immediately, like, as it started appearing at these fairs and shows, uh, oddly, other Bonnie and Clyde cars started appearing at fairs and shows across the country, claiming to be the actual death car. And that started taking revenue away from Ruth because at the people started questioning her about whether or not this was the original car. It's like, how can this be the car if there's one in Ohio and there's one in Florida and there's one in Texas? Um, and so she said, all right, let's just sever ties. So she ended up uh, selling it for $3,500. Um, oh, no. And, and it, it continued to be exhibited. I remember seeing photos of it being raced. Like they put like a new engine in. It was like racing it and it, uh, there was paint on the side that said Bonnie and Clyde's death car. Um, and then interest was renewed when the movie came out in 1967. So there's the Warren Beatty, Faye right. Dunaway version of uh, Bonnie and Clyde. And so to confuse matters even more, now there was a movie version of the Bonnie and Clyde death car in addition to the original, uh, which that car was faked and, dis and displayed at various places. And I'm a victim of it because well, I'll get to it in a second. Um, so in 1973, the car was uh, purchased by Peter Simon of the Oasis Casino in Jean, Nevada for $175,000. And it was eventually put on display at Whiskey Pete's Casino in Prim, Nevada, where it had sat for decades. Now, by sheer coincidence, I went to L.A. for uh, just a vacation. I was staying up in Porter Ranch, California, where some friends were letting me stay at their, their loft. And I found out that within, I don't know, 15 minutes or so where I was staying is the uh, Ronald Reagan Library. To my shock, they had a temporary uh, FBI exhibit, which included artifacts from 9-11 and the shoe bomber and other things like that. And the original Bonnie and Clyde death car. It was on loan for this exhibit by Whiskey Pete's. So this car was a mere 15 minutes away from me. So I hopped in my car, toured the museum, uh, was just awe-inspired by the museum. I mean, they had, they had Reagan's uh, Air Force One. They had Marine One, the helicopter. They had his limo. Okay. Uh, they had his uh, jacket with a bullet hole in it yeah, uh, from the say, assassination did they, attempt. Did they have a lock of hair of uh, John Hinckley Jr.? <laughs> <laughs> I think they had that. But the museum was very, very impressive. And if you're ever up in Simi Valley, California, check out the Ronald Reagan uh, exhibit or museum. Now, that FBI exhibit was just temporary, so I'm glad I got to see it when I did. I have read that since the car has been returned to uh, Whiskey Pete's, where it sits now. Um, but uh, about a month after that experience, I was in Las Vegas, and I'm not a big gambler, and so I was looking for other things to do, and I found a museum called the Hollywood Cars Museum in Las Vegas, and oh, I'll go check it out, and I take an Uber over to the building, and it was just sort of this... Uh, industrial looking area where you're like, this is a museum. I thought I was getting set up. 
And uh, I go inside the museum, and it was awesome. There was a huge display of Hollywood cars. And, um, and so as I'm walking through, to my surprise, I see a Ford V8 with these bullet holes in it. There's a light cream color, which was different than the, the actual car, which was a little darker. And there was a plaque nearby that said, this is the Bonnie and Clyde movie car. And I was like, what are the odds of me seeing the original car and then one month later accidentally stumbling onto the Bonnie and Clyde movie car? Right. Uh, but as I'm doing my research today, I found out that car is a fake. Yeah. And I'm upset because there, nothing on that plaque said this is a replica, this is a tribute. It said this is the Bonnie and Clyde movie car. Uh, the actual Bonnie and Clyde movie car is on display, but it is at the Alcatraz East Crime Museum in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And since we're on the uh, topic of uh, cars, and this might be a good segue for Andrew in a second, uh, on display at Alcatraz East is Ted Bundy's VW Bug, uh, John Dillinger's 1933 Essex Terraplane made by the Hudson Motor Company, uh, the Ford V8 from the Bonnie and Clyde movie, and a white Ford Bronco uh, is on display at this museum in Pittsburgh. Surprise, Ford. surprise. So, so, <laughs> also, so I'm just kind of curious. Ruth's car, the insurance is more when it had 122 bullet holes in it <laughs> <laughs> compared to when it was originally a whole car. Oh, sure. Now, the insurance when it's like, oh, no, oh, you want insurance on this Binding Clyde car? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a lot more. Ruth. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. But uh, what a crazy series of circumstances. And I can't believe Las Vegas lied to you. I know, isn't that shocking? Now, the, here's the weird thing about that particular museum, and I'm, I'm so glad that I did the research over the past few days, but that museum, that Hollywood Cars Museum in Las Vegas, has multiple uh, authentic cars from television and film. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of the cars I stumbled onto when I was there was James Bond's underwater submarine, uh, the Lotus Esprit that dives off on and off a dock into the water and converts oh, yeah. into a submarine. Uh, they had one of the authentic cars used in the film, which by sheer coincidence, I had seen get restored on American restorations. You ever see that show with Rick Dale on the history channel? Yeah, I've heard of he it. Does a show called American restorations. They brought in this shell of a Lotus Esprit and he, it was an authentic screen use shell and Rick Dale converted that car into the showpiece that uh, was restored for the desert collection which is in miami the desert collection ended up buying out and starting the hollywood cars museum in vegas and put part of their collection on display in vegas so that's what's so confusing is they have authentic really really valuable uh tv and movie cars and a fake bonnie and clyde uh, car so a little confused by that i don't understand Maybe just one slip through the barrier <laughs> yeah uh and that's that's a big pet peeve of mine i hate when i see something cool and then i find out later that it was a fake i, I remember going to a museum in hollywood that claimed to have an original pair of ruby slippers from the wizard of oz i'm like no those aren't real and then i i reached out to a contact of mine and said what's the story behind the ruby slippers and he goes oh i know the guy who made those 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 aren't genuine uh, and it pissed me off like why are you telling people this is the real deal and i know why because it brings people through the door yeah, but it's it's it's, it's not it's charlatan yeah. charlatan <laughs> ah makes me mad anywho i wanted to segue from the white ford bronco at alcatraz east to Andrew's first car. Yes. Uh, tell us about the white Ford Bronco. That white Ford Bronco that O.J. Simpson. Now, let's just back up a little bit. This this whole time, my whole life, I thought it was just O.J. Simpson himself driving that car. No, it was his buddy named uh, Al Collins. Yeah. Al, Al Collins and driving it and it was Cowling's car. It wasn't even OJ's car. Yeah. Now even, they had matching identical cars. Yes. And and OJ's was parked back at his Rockingham yep. estate. And it was owned by the Hertz uh car rental company because OJ was a spokesman ah. for for it. So I guess they loaned it to him for whatever you know, just 
for promotional. That was the you. worst car chase I've ever seen because it was so <laughs> slow. Can <laughs> right. someone just stop it? There's some cow traps in front of this. Yeah, so I, up to that point, everyone knew uh, OJ. He played 10 or 11 seasons uh, in NFL, uh, broke a couple records. I just came across this. He was the first NFL player to rush more than 2,000 yards in one yeah, season yeah, in 1973. Is. Uh, he was, uh, like I said, uh, everybody loved him. Great athlete, actor. Yes, then he could gun movies. He did a, a lot of yeah, Towering <laughs> Inferno. From what I, I saw naked, him and Naked Gun one and two when I was a kid, and right around the same time that it, it came out that you know the mur- the murder thing. So I'm like, <laughs> Dad, is is that the same guy? This guy? I'm scared. I'm telling you what, he he could murder NFL defenses. <laughs> I just like, saw a slit their slit their throats. I saw a SNL skits just like yesterday where Tim Meadows was playing OJ after he had gotten <laughs> out of prison and he was back on the sideline during a football game and he's doing the telestrator. Do you remember this? And he spells out with the telestrator, I did it. <laughs> just hysterical. And what was the name of the, the book that OJ wrote? Uh oh, yeah. if, if I, I did if it, I did right? it. Yeah, yeah, if I did it. Yeah, search for the real killers on the back nine. Anyway, that that car chase, yeah, it it. It lasted, uh, I think, two hours, uh, and watched all over the world. <laughs> About two a- hours, sixty miles, low speed. Yeah, that's... and apparently OJ the whole time ha- held a-, a gun to his head. Yeah, like, like, had the mentality of, oh shoot, if we get caught right now, I'm gonna yeah. kill myself. And that's what an innocent person would do. Yeah, right? absolutely. That's, that's what we we all would do. Yeah. So this this happened only uh, four or five days after the actual murder. When the police closed in on and and said, "We don't really have anyone else," I'm, we're pretty <laughs> sure he did it. And then later on, they, they found OJ's Bronco had the DNA yeah. of himself, Nicole, and, and Ron, Ron Gold. Goldman. Yeah. So anyway, uh. so uh, we'll just fast forward a, li- a little bit. Uh, I'll tell you one thing: Johnny Cochran's a good lawyer. <laughs> yeah, That's and right. uh, Kardashian yeah. helped get him off too. Well, the big, I think the thing that got O.J. off the hook was Mark Furman, the racist L.A. cop who lied about being racist, and then they presented evidence that he was racist, which proved he lied on the stand. So now when they say this racist cop planted the evidence, that plants the seed of doubt. Right, and I remember that threw a a big monkey wrench in the whole thing. Yeah. But anyway... um, I don't. I didn't. I, I read that soon after uh, they got the DNA blood evidence out of OJ's car, it was destroyed. Like the car was destroyed. I don't. I, I didn't research it, if it was destroyed by the LAPD or who, but yeah, it was destroyed. Um, but the famous Bronco, um, they didn't really do much with it for a while, and it kind of sat in storage, and then it was sold to OJ's. Uh, agent or former agent his name was mike gilbert and he bought it for 75 grand mm. Yikes. um from uh l collins um and then he kept it for 20 years and didn't really drive it they just he would start it ride it around just to just to make sure it didn't uh decay you know oh sure and, and I remember, at, you know, there was a period of time where I was like, whatever happened to the Ford Bronco? Like, nobody knew what had happened to it. Right. And they said that only 20 miles had been put on it mm. since 1994. Wow. And like you said, it now sits at the, what's it called? Alcatraz Alcatraz, Alcatraz East, East Museum oh, yeah. in Pigeon Forge, which I didn't even, A, I didn't know that place existed. And I, I've driven through Pigeon Forge millions of times visiting my family in Georgia. Yeah. And it's a big tourist area for those who don't know about it. But next time I uh, drive through there, I might have to take a take a stop and maybe do an hour and a half little tour of that yeah. place because, like you said, there are plenty of other things to see there. Yeah. Um, now, there is a footnote. Uh, I'm a big fan of those History Channel shows, uh, Pawn Stars, American Pickers, American Restoration. And I remember watching one episode where a guy – might have been this uh, this uh, guy you were talking about the what'd you say former agent or something yeah uh, Gilbert Gilbert yeah, yeah. Uh, walked through the door of the pawn shop in Vegas and said I have a vehicle uh, I want you to look at uh, you know, to Rick and, and those guys so he said pull it around back we'll take a look at it they walk out in the the rear 
parking lot area there, and there's a white Ford Bronco. And they were like, is this the white Ford Bronco? And he said, yes, it is. And so, of course, you know, they milk it. They tell the story. And when it finally came time to make an offer, they said, we don't want this. We, we, this is not what we do. We're not interested. And they passed on it. Um, so now we know where it is today. Right. And apparently, um, the former agent, Mark Gilbert, he still has the original the registration, mm. the original tires, and they siphoned the gas out of it because yeah. he, he knew that, it, that, you know, this is, this is going to be famous <laughs> forever. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, what are you going to do with the gas? I don't know. Does I don't know if that was more of a maintenance Bronco. sort yeah. of a thing, or, okay. or, or does he be. keep it in a jar like right. a specimen, you know? Gil, Gil, <laughs> what is that on your shelf? Well, that's the gas from the white Ford Bronco that Al Collins drew. That's what we call the Bronco piss. Now, you know what's interesting? Yeah. You know, I, I collect die-cast cars. That's one of the reasons we're, we're doing this podcast. I'm a big car buff and TV and movie cars and, and that sort of thing. And I, I have a huge collection of die-cast cars at home, and... I always thought it'd be fun to do like a line of notorious cars in toy form. And I I understand why toy companies wouldn't want to do that. But there's a company called Greenlight who just this year, probably within the last few months, released a white Ford Bronco, same make, year, model. They know what they're doing. They Sure. People are snatching this thing up. Also, I think it was, what, two years ago, Ford actually brought the Bronco brought, back. Brought it back. Yeah. And I remember people going, oh, <laughs> yeah, boy, right. has it been long enough? Also, well, wasn't it? They were going to, like, unveil it or reveal it or, or, or reveal it on the anniversary of the murder or something oh, crazy like that. And people are like, that. don't do that. And so they delayed it a little bit. Now, I don't think they were deliberately going to do it. I think it was a coincidence that it was going to happen. But they said, all right, let's let's." Joe, you're delay. giving too much credit. Yeah. It was, it was some, <laughs> some dummy in the marketing, but let's do that. Like, do you get what this was some, about? Some guerrilla marketing. Yeah. Um, also, another Michigan connection for the original run that the Bronco went for uh, or was manufactured for maybe 30 years or so. It was built at the Wayne Assembly Plant down in Wayne, hmm. in Wayne County. Yep, a lot of famous criminal cars built right here in the middle of the Michigan. <laughs> There's a fascination, you know. That's why I think if someone were to do a line of cars, the Bonnie and Clyde car, the James Dean uh, Porsche, which I do have some replicas at home of that particular car, uh, I think people would have a morbid curiosity to collect these uh, die-cast cars based on these notorious cars. Now, would I add Ted Bundy's VW Bug to my collection? No, Probably no. not. Ugh. But when I add Al Capone's, you know, Cadillac or whatever, sure, I might, I might do that. So I'll tell you one thing: thank God the Titanic didn't crash in shallower waters, because you know <laughs> there'd be some circumstances down there. I got a piece of the hull. Well, th- that's exactly what they're doing. I just, I mean, I saw the big piece of the Titanic. Again, it's in Vegas of all places. Uh, but they pulled this giant piece of the Titanic off the seafloor. The first time they tried to do it, the a storm broke and uh, the cables uh, snapped and the thing fell back down to the ocean floor <laughs> where it stuck in the muck for two years. And then they did it again and pulled it up. And then just recently, just a few days ago, I didn't even know this had existed, but apparently in some Titanic museum somewhere, there's the first class gangway door has been pulled off the seafloor and is on display in a museum so there you go they've been collecting artifacts from that site for a long time and, and you could argue you know is it grave robbing or is it preserving history for future generations but and <laughs> some people are literally dying to go see it yeah, exactly I couldn't help yourself. The, Sorry. I don't have the, yes, couldn't help yourself. <laughs> that was. That I mean, it was a layup. It was there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, All right. What's your next car? Uh, the 1966 Buick Electra 225, built at Flint's Buick City. <laughs> All right. And so Miss Jane Mansfield. Oh boy. Died in it. Mm. Uh, tragic. An extremely gruesome story uh she was traveling with um her children she had three children children, yeah one of whom went to become uh on to become a famous actress mariska hargaday Mm -hmm. oh okay she uh, was law and order Order. she was asleep in the back seat with her siblings yeah uh and so uh the two uh 
adults with riding with her were instantly killed. Yeah. Now the driver, his name is Ronald Harrison. I, I found out recently that he was fairly young, and he was, I guess, tasked with driving Jane Mansfield around to her next appearance that was scheduled. And then the other person was uh, an attorney and uh, yep. I guess Sam a romantic Brody. interest. And so yeah. the, apparently all three were sitting in the front seat together. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So that that was uh, her attorney, Sam Brody, who, like I said, there are rumors that she was sleeping with. But, I mean, I, the more you read about her, who who didn't she sleep with? <laughs> now, that, that's the o- one of the only instances I know of real brothers becoming Eskimo brothers, John and Robert Kennedy. Oh, yeah. I, oh. Uh, <laughs> I And I didn't know that. I, see, Jane, I mean, we're going a little off topic here, but I, I had just read today, which I did not know, that because Marilyn Monroe had expressed interest in JFK, that Jane took a shot at Marilyn, or at, at JFK. Yep. And when they apparently consummated their relationship, she said, Oh, I bet Marilyn is angry right now. So she did it just to spite Marilyn, which I had never heard that story before. I, I, I read that that uh, Marilyn like looked down on her and said, "You know, she's she's a B version of me, and she's you know, kind of slutty and whatever." Yeah. And then, of course, everyone knows the the famous photo of Sophia Loren given the side yeah. eye when she's just pouring out of that dress. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and if I remember correctly. I saw a documentary about nudity in film. I believe Jane Mansfield had the first nude appearance in a mainstream, commercially released, non-pornographic film. So that was one of her claims. Yeah. Uh, it's called Promises, Promises, and I got I got it queued up on Amazon Prime. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that called... you have queued up. Pro- pro- <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch LA Confidential one day, fellas. Come on. Now, I, I I saw Nick's look when I said I watched this documentary, and that's exactly what it was. It was a Hulu documentary, <laughs> and it was very tasteful. So don't give me that look. So uh, there was there was uh, rumors that um, she was decapitated, oh. but um, it was later found out that someone had seen either she was wearing a wig or yeah. there, she had a wig with her from her performance or whatever. She was driving from Biloxi to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And the the car just slammed right into the back, probably going full speed uh, yeah. of a semi. Yeah. Now at that time, they didn't have like the lower like step uh, bars to get into a semi. Yeah. But because of this incident, the the federal highway system or whatever uh, they mandated yeah. that all semis have this lower bar, and they call it the Mansfield bar. Yeah. Oh boy! Um, yeah, it went pretty it, far under the truck. From and, from what I read, it it hit her, and I'm guessing the other two uh, adults, right, the, right, yeah. right in the forehead, and and just yeah. instantly, uh, yeah. instantly took their lives, which is like I said, it's you know, extremely disgusting, yeah, whatever. Right, but, yeah. um, so some some factors in the crash that I had read about. One was it was like early in the morning, like 2 or 3 a.m., the driver was very young, so he's probably inexperienced. And I also read that that area had recently been fogging for mosquitoes. And so there was was a machine, and I can't even picture what it would look like, but apparently this machine was releasing a fog to kill mosquitoes. The car was driving at a fairly high rate of speed. It can hardly see in front of them, and then all of a sudden you come around a turn, and there's a stop. Well, semi no, that makes right sense because that was the unit. That was the federal government's program to get rid of malaria. Mm. That, that's why in the south, that's okay. why we haven't had, you know, any malaria cases in the United States, no West Nile, none of that stuff until yeah. just recently because that was the program. But yeah, of all the timings, and yeah. it happened at two twenty-five a.m., which pitch black. Oh. Yeah, and <laughs> so if anyone's right. been in in southern Louisiana, just outside of New Orleans, there's nothing but oh yeah, swamp. It's extremely scary, swampy, dark. So imagine, um, you know, your headlights all of a sudden are illuminating this cloud of vapor in front of you. And, and all of a sudden. Yeah. That's there's it. a semi right in front of you. Oh, jeez. And it also took the chihuahua, too. There. Yeah, she had a dog with her. Yep. There, she yeah. had a dog. Um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to say about it, but interesting, a year after it happened, two wrongful death lawsuits were filed on behalf of um, of her. Um 
of her of her family or uh, against on behalf of, of Jane and Matt Simber. Okay. Who So the estate of Jane Matt. Yeah, the estate. Okay. Yeah. Um the the car was saved by a private collector in Florida where it became a roadside attraction in the seventies. Really? Yep. Well, I know where that car is today. Do you have that information in front of you? The car is owned by Scott Michaels and is housed and shown at his dearly departed tours and artifact museum. It is. So here's what's interesting. Uh, prior to COVID, I had learned that the, uh, the car was on display at this museum. So if you sign up for the dearly departed tour, the gathering place is this museum. And they have all kinds of morbid and creepy things on display like Vincent Price's medication or something. And, <laughs> uh, and the car is on display. And unfortunately, when COVID ro- rolled around, uh, it, it closed. And so I kept checking to see when it was going to reopen to the public. And I was sad to find out that it had closed permanently until like earlier this year. And I found out that the museum has reopened to the public. So next time you're in LA, if you have a morbid curiosity, you can see the car that uh, Jane Mansfield was riding in. Wow. Add yeah, that's, the list. And, and then she was born uh, in Pennsylvania and that's where she was buried. Uh, that's okay. Yeah. So She's like 34, 34 years 30, old. Man. Yeah. 30. Yes. Extremely young. Just, uh, just like uh, Marilyn and, and, and again, uh, yeah. Rebel Without a Cause, man. He was yeah, tw- yeah. 24, I yeah. believe. Yeah. yeah. None of these people uh, die old. No, nope. live fast, die young. Well, maybe Grace Kelly. She was fairly young, too. Yeah. She was, uh, what was, fif- well, 52, which yeah. is young to me because I've passed that. But uh, that's uh, fairly young for Grace Kelly, yeah. Yeah. But, yep. yikes. I mean. That's, well, I mean, look, that wasn't meant to be my transition to you. I was just trying to pick that, that was nature. But, I mean, I guess that brings me up to my yeah. my trio of uh, vehicular debts, and Grace Kelly was one of them. Now, unlike Joe and Andrew, I don't have a lot of salacious details with this. They're like, okay, we'll take Grace Kelly, Princess of Monaco, for those of you that don't want to that know. She died on September 13th, um, technically September 14th, 1982, because she was in a car crash on September 13th while her and her daughter were driving to the station uh her daughter was supposed to go up to school but they were having an argument apparently that's what they say but it turns out that grace kelly had suffered a stroke while driving her daughter stephanie tried to reach over and grab the steering wheel tried to pull the parking brake the handbrake tried everything she could but her mom's foot kind of just kept going on the accelerator because of the stroke Mm -hmm. they went off a cliff down a 120 foot slope ended up in someone's garden but the they neither were wearing seat belts, which I think will be a commonality if we looked in all of our sure. And the gardener of the of the house down there pulled Stephanie out of the driver's side, so there was a little bit of people like, oh, maybe she was driving. She wasn't. She was flung onto the driver's side. Grace Kelly was pitched into the back, mm. and wow. she survived the injuries technically, but she was brain dead, and that's mm. what happened. Oh. She was pronounced dead the next next day. They had pulled her off life support. Her husband never remarried because he was just devastated by it he never took another boy and mm. but they they were they were just trying, there was nothing really remarkable about, about the car it's a 1971 uh roll roll well, i think uh oh, i have it right here 1971 rover p6 yeah. 3500 and i had looked up images online and it's you know it looks like a kind of a british yeah, car, yeah. And uh, she, so and it she wasn't had, made in michigan no, no not, not none, of my, none of my vehicles there. have any made in michigan unfortunately so uh, you didn't get there. the memo that the, all <laughs> yeah the I, I i did when i was picking oh, when, when these when i was going with these three now the thing was she had a driver and the driver insisted like i'll drive you but she mm-hmm. said no there's not with there's not with all the luggage we can't take three people mm. i'll drive oh. and so the driver just kind of always beat himself up about it. He said, I should have insisted for madam. I should have mm. driven her. Yeah. Wow. It was my job. That's my only job is to drive her. Yeah. I mean, the, the tragic thing is, is that, I mean, she was one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood. Agreed. And <laughs> man, there, I have a eight by 10 of her hanging up in my uh, wall of fame at home. And you just look up pictures of Grace Kelly and it's, it's jaw dropping. She's just I mean, from the time when she started to, you know, with Hitchcock and then marrying, yeah. and then marrying into royalty. Well, then, yeah, that's the thing. She gave up her Hollywood career yeah. <laughs> to become a princess. <laughs> the princess of Monaco. Yeah. And the thing is, one of the people who attended her 
funeral was Princess Diana. Oh, uh, I didn't know. Yeah, that. which was one of my other. <laughs> oh, that right would have been right when they got married, like a year after her and Charles got married. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wow. wow. Because 1982, she she attends. Uh, she said they were friends. She Prince Diana was you know th- thought of her as a as a as a colleague and, and mm. someone that she you know in, could talk to because it's very it, it's a different when you enter into those circles of royalty yeah. the royal family it's like your uh, circles get a little smaller yeah. Yeah. it's a very different clique she kind of got what Di, uh, Princess Di was going through and so unfortunately when you know then Princess Di ends up in her own accident which mm. is. Of all the three stories that I got, this one is the one that actually had any. I try. I was telling Joe and Andrew this uh, before we started. I tried like hell to keep this on the on the straight and narrow, and not because you could take a little turn to the left and you're in conspiracy theory ter- territory. <coughs> oh sure. Now the thing is, on August thirty first, nineteen ninety seven, uh, Dodi Fayed, who was the son of Muhammad Fayed, uh, was in the car with Princess Diana the bodyguard, and the driver, Henri Paul, who worked for the Ritz, which was owned by uh, Dodi Fayette's father. And they were trying to get rid of the, escape the paparazzi, and the turn at the Alma Bridge, or it's a French name, I'm not going to pronounce it, because I know how French people get about Americans butchering <laughs> French. I've been to France, it's happened. Huh? So anyway, they go underneath the tunnel, and at 65 miles an hour, according to the report, the car slams into one of these cement pillars, and you look at the, the wreckage of it, it's horrific. Uh, Princess Diana was apparently still alive when they got to her, and she one of the last words she said to the fireman was, "What what happened?" Oh, she didn't I, know, I yeah. didn't know that. Okay. None of them were wearing seatbelts apparently, because uh, apparently this is just one of those things. The survivor, who was the bodyguard, had to go through reconstructive surgery. They reset his jaw. They thought mm. his tongue was gone, and he can't remember what happened because a lot of his oh sure because of the of the damage so even yeah, when he wrote you a book experience on trauma it. like that yeah. you don't remember anything like even the events leading up to the accident right yeah. wow and now and people blame the paparazzi and there there was a trial on that you know george Clooney got involved and somehow they said george Clooney the the paparazzi got mad at him for kind of you know Laying, laying this at their feet. They said, we're going to boycott you. And I'm like, do you promise? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not a threat to yeah, a, Don't Hollywood threaten school. me with a good time. Yeah, we'll boycott you, George Clooney. He's like, okay, don't yeah. stop. <laughs> I seem to recall reading that some members of the paparazzi that were in pursuit were the first ones to like approach the car. And I don't know if any of them had the guts to snap photos. Uh, now, I did learn that there are photos online that, that claim to be of Diana and those have turned out to be fake right. frauds. Those aren't real. So I don't, I have to imagine there's probably photos that exist out there, but I can't imagine the paparazzi that basically caused this accident to happen. If they were to take pictures of it and then sell that. I, I, right. I, would, I think at that point, MI6 would get involved in burning. Well, those. That, <laughs> and that's what Dodi Fayette's father was claiming. Was like this was an operation by, it was a hit by MI6. This is the whole, when you try to keep it on the straight and narrow. Right. Yeah. But this is at least what he said. Publicly, so it's not like someone heard him say it. Like, this is what he kept alleging. He could say it's a father's grief, and he's just lashing out. Sure. Uh, the official reports that Henri Paul, the driver, was had a lot of uh, drugs and alcohol in his, in his system, so they blame that. A friend of Henri Paul was like, that doesn't sound like him at all. He would mm-hmm. never do that. His records is implicit. But they said, look, this is what the toxicology report says. This is what the, the coroner's report says. So yeah. we're going to go. That's the official thing. There was Operation Pad pageant i think it was what the british government made a did an investigation official investigation they said hey listen this is what it is it was the driver did it there's nothing you know somebody somebody gave that command somebody gave that order in the car to say lose these guys and it that was a fatal decision and there's obstacles and it's dangerous they clipped a white fiat along there that's and people were saying this white fiat who's like yeah the their her princess dies don't if it's car grazed mine along the way and i saw it happen so that car everyone's like oh can you tell us what's going on yeah that became a thing now where this the problem rises is if there's nothing to hide don't invite the conspiracy they don't really need a lot to go Mm. so the car what happened to the car yeah the car is actually owned by a company um mr musa uh, mercy i think is his name and he says it's my car it's my limo it's fully paid i it's not even on financing i own the car it was and I do business with the Ritz. Mm. So this car was what was the one being used. I would like my property back. It was taken, investigated for all, all and then it was stored in a container. And up until uh, 2017, it was in a container on the outskirts of France. Mm. So the, when they went to ask the mayor of Paris, 
because they, you know, they were like, hey, can we can we get it back? And Mary Paris, like, I don't know what you're talking about. And so when they finally went to go get a piece of the car, because the door that the side that clipped the white Fiat is missing. Because oh. and they said it was got burnt in a fire. They're like, how does a fire start there? Hmm. So it's like these, you know, where you kind of wrinkle your brain. Like, yes, there was technically a fire. Yes, parts parts of the wreckage are gone, but the wreckage is still there. This was an article that was uh, written in 2022. So oh, yeah, they just can't seem to get their hand. And he keeps demanding. He's like, I want it back. Hmm. It's mine. It's my car. I, so, I would like. So the back. French government is they won't it, let him. They're not. There's every time he asks, it's like it's like. It's like you point a finger. So for those of us on video, I'm pointing at Joe and Joel point. It's like the the, the triangle where everyone points the, the Spider Man. What? Yeah, <laughs> Mexican the stand. Yeah, everyone points the gun, uh, the finger to every, every person. And so he's like, "This is frustrating. I would like the car back because we've had the investigation. So yeah. why why can't he get it back?" My question is, if France is is hiding the car, or whatever, is it out of respect? Is it because they think that this car will be exploited, oh, paraded around? Maybe. Put on ex- exhibition. But, this is the. But come out and say that though. Come yeah. Out and, at least have a stance. Yeah. Don't just say what do you, what do we don't know nothing. What are you talking about? That's horrible yeah. French action. But I. But anyway, <laughs> and the British royalty has said, we want the car destroyed, flat out. We don't want it anymore. Yeah, like, and I think, well, that's what I think should happen to wow. it. It should be melted into a cube. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Netflix got a, the Crown got in trouble because they kind of showed the accident, and people were like, oh, I was like, yeah, you kind. of Probably didn't need to show that. We all know what what happened that day. That doesn't mean need to be one. Was of it captured things. on like CCTV or anything like that? Or that's not. And again, when we're talking about the the whole conspiracy, please don't feed the conspiracy theorists. It's like please don't feed the pigeons. Yeah, it's they can't seem to get that. There's always pockets of, that are missing at the wrong time. I'm like, okay, yeah, well, it must have been the same people who installed the cameras at Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein's yeah. cell. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Huh. It's, yeah. Huh. two two hours yeah. just missing. But, but it's like it's these weird things. Like, why is only that part missing? You can see it going into the tunnel. You can wow. see all the stuff going into the tunnel. But That's then why can't you get the stuff of the actual crash? Because you yeah. have CCTV. And then if you want to get footage of, uh, and because there's plenty of paparazzi. Yeah. Why can't you get the footage of a car? Like they were taking detailed shots of the car after it was, after it was being loaded up onto the on the truck and driven away. Mm. So and again, like like hell, I'm trying to keep this on the street. Yes, now. yeah, sure. I'm I'm I don't know. Maybe I'm naive. I'd like to think that this was all done out of respect, but who knows? And and then once you do that, like let's say there's some people who say, look, we're gonna out of respect for Princess Di, we're gonna we're gonna lose the footage. We're gonna lose the car. But now, as soon as you start doing that, then you go. People go, "Where's the footage? Where's the car?" And it spawns. And this is what this. I've always said about the conspiracy theories. Why? Yeah. Why? Why? Why Princess Diana? Yeah, she wasn't a, a royalty anymore. She's walked away from that life. What she was a private could, citizen. Yeah. What secrets could she have about the about the royal family that she wouldn't have already like written in a diary and said, "In the event of my death, give this to William <laughs> and, right. and Harry." You know. Like, yeah, yeah. I I think what I've always heard was that um. Uh, the. Qu- Queen uh, Elizabeth and what was her husband's name? Uh, Philip. Uh, Philip at the time. Yeah. And and Charles were like extremely pissed that she was so pop, like much more popular oh, sure. than Charles. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the like the, the divorce just was was really ugly. And, well, it was scandalous. And, and the the, yeah. the bad publicity for the crown. So some mm. people think that was cause enough to mm. get rid of her. But yeah. I don't I don't one hundred percent buy that. But there's, there's always a possibility, and we we know governments have I mean, done look, worse things. You, <laughs> so, you know, sure. James Dean, you know, it's like, oh, what the studio have done. Well, the studio like their actors. They don't want to kill their actors. In fact, they, oh, when you yeah. still let up, like, James, please don't drive this car. Yeah. You're too valuable. Please don't drive this car. Right. Yeah, and he did. Yeah, it's not like they'd go out of the way like, oh, we're going to stop you because, you know, there has to be an incentive. Why would you get rid of these people? Now, the... Uh... The Princess Diana death, that's one of those moments in my life where I remember the moment I heard about it. I was in my old apartment. A buddy was hanging out. I don't know if we were watching a movie or what. And my sister calls me, who always seemed to be the bearer of bad news. She's the one who broke 9-11 to me. (laughs) Every time she calls, I go cold, like, who died? (laughs) And sure enough, I pick up the phone, and she's like, did you hear? I'm like, who? Princess Diana died. I'm like get out of here and turn on the TV and you see the news reports starting to come in. And 
There's a there's a video that's gone viral. You could probably find it on YouTube where there's a group of guys. I don't know if they're playing cards or they're doing something. And while this camera is rolling, a news break comes on the TV and says Princess Diana died. And you see their genuine reaction to the news where they're yeah. like, what? So when people ask you, you know, where are you on 9-11? That Princess Diana death is one of those moments where yeah, I, remember I remember where I was, what I was doing when it happened. And the thing is, I, you know, obviously it didn't hit me as much, but you have a better appreciation of Princess Diana as you, because I was a lot younger at the time. And for all the living in a fishbowl and all the attention, she she was genuinely a nice person. To yeah. All people. She, and she went out of her way. to she, Her cause was, I'm going to get rid of minefields. Exactly. Yeah. And there were clear minds that were wounding and, and killing maiming and maiming kids and innocent yeah. people. And so, and then she was, you know, unfairly, like she, if people touched, like, don't touch the royalty. She didn't care. She was all, above all that. So that kind of like what endeared her to people. I think, exactly. talk about the popularity contest. Where they're like, "Ew, don't touch us, these commoners." And then, <laughs> and then there's and, was, and and like early in the AIDS crisis, wasn't she one of the first people that like yeah. famous people that she would go visit? And because hold back then, people like people. you can't touch people with AIDS. You'll get AIDS. She's yeah. like, "Nope." She would hug them. She would hold on to yeah. them. And, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that that's Trans what you plus. can for when you do stuff like that. That's what you you talk about the visceral reaction where people was like, I, I, "I'm not." And by the way, I bring this as an example. I'm not making a direct correlation when FDR died. Mm-hmm. There were they the the famous things like there's a a, a, a janitor who's uh, attending the funeral procession. He's crying. I ask him like, why do you did you know him? He's like, no, but he knew me because the whole he cared about workers kind yeah. of thing. Oh, yeah. okay. So same mm-hmm. that concept of Prince Dan like would care about people. So that's why you never know. You don't know her. You don't know her, but you feel it. Yeah. 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 Tragic loss. So did you have any others there? I did have Matthew Broderick, but when I lead up, when I come up with Princess Die, this feels like a standard. <laughs> Matthew Broderick and Jennifer Grey, 1987, August 7th, were in Northern Ireland. They just finished Ferris Bueller's Day Off. They, I mean, they met on there, and they became, they started a relationship. They go to celebrate. They were driving. Matthew Broderick's driving, and he's, I don't know if this is an American thing, but he's on the wrong side of the road, and he kills a 28-year-old woman and her mother, a 63-year-old mother, in a collision an American forgetting which side of the road they drive on in the UK right. kills a and young he can't, person. And anyway. because he had a concussion, he can't remember anything up until waking up in the hospital. And, and so he doesn't even remember saying, are they okay? Are they okay? Did I hurt them? Because Jennifer Gray was there. She was conscious. She said, heard Matthew saying that. The police and fire were saying the same thing. This is what Matthew kept asking. He can't seem to remember anything other than waking up from the hospital. Yeah, he spent a month in the hospital, yeah. and this is the part that blows my mind. I know it was an accident, but uh, despite being charged with reckless driving, he walked away with a $175 fine yeah. for killing two people, man. And that was a huge thing. Like, it was a huge tra- travesty because was, uh, he was facing a minimum of five years in prison. I was going to say uh, manslaughter, vehicular manslaughter, I, I thought would be at least 10. But, it, yeah. And, wow. And it, it, it was this it was the scandal because of the consequences. Like there was no consequences to this. And yeah. the family eventually, the son uh, of the, uh, of the relatives who, who passed away said, I, I forgave him. I don't mm-hmm. want to hold on to the anger. Matthew Broderick said he was going to reach out to me and we were going to meet at some point. It never happened. Mm-hmm. He uh-huh. didn't write a letter expressing his sorrow. Wow. And then at a 2012 Super Bowl commercial, he's a spokesperson for Honda when he's driving. And they asked, they asked the son, like, what do you think about this? Like, ah, you know, I've let it go. But, Probably could have picked a better spokesman. <laughs> you know, something similar happened fairly recently. When when you Google, you know, celebrity accidents and stuff like that, one name that comes up is Caitlyn Jenner. And I yeah. think there's video of that accident where she wasn't paying attention. She plowed into a vehicle, killing the other driver, and as far as I know, faced zero consequences. Yeah, yeah there was nothing. Why is that? I don't understand that. If, if, if one of us three did that, I, we'd be facing five to ten. Yeah, I'd be in Guantanamo. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say, I'd, if but I send fir- me to Guantanamo. The, the first thing they would ask you is, uh, how many time, times a day do you pray? Oh, sorry, what, wrong religion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another name that comes up when you do when you Google this topic, uh, Sam Kinison. On April 10th, 1992, he was driving his Pontiac Turbo Trans Am. Uh, he was on his way to a show in Laughlin, uh, Nevada, to perform at the Riverside Casino for a sold-out show. And a 17-year-old uh, Troy Pearson, uh, who had alcohol in his system, decided to pass somebody and collided head-on with Sam Kinison. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
there's witnesses that said that Sam Kinison, as he, you know, drifted off, had a conversation with somebody like, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And then, okay. Like he was, someone was saying, step into the light, you know, oh, wow. that's the, that's part of the story. But a uh, 17 year old guy, uh, I don't know what kind of consequences he faced, but uh, he had alcohol in his system. Uh, his wife was in the car with him and she survived the crash. Um, so that was a tragic loss. That was uh, back in 1992. And then a story I want to kind of close on, another famous one that affected me personally deeply. And I want to start off with this weird kind of a coincidence. So I'm a huge fan of the Fast and Furious movies. I I saw the first one in every single movie that's come out over the past two decades. All time of them? Even Uh, Tokyo Drift? Well, you know what's funny? Tokyo (laughs) Drift which didn't feature Paul Walker or Vin Diesel, I kind of dismissed that for the longest time and didn't even count that one. But then I revisited it. I'm like, you know what? It's not that bad. It's actually an entertaining movie. And and then, spoiler alert, there is a little cameo by Vin Diesel at the end. Uh, but I've enjoyed all of those movies. I know they've gotten progressive, uh, progressively sillier as time went on. Um, but I remember going online and seeing a, a, an article going viral or news going viral that Paul Walker was killed in a single car wreck. And and he had a quote that was similar to a quote that James Dean had about, you know, if I'm going to die, I want to die doing what I love, you know, driving fast or whatever. So this rumor went out. And so I started, you know, researching it and found out that it was fake. It was a lie that he was still alive and well. The very next day, he died in a car wreck. Yikes. The next day. And so when I saw the news starting to break that Paul Walker had died in a car crash, I got angry. And I said, that was a rumor that was just started. It's not true. And people are like, no, it's starting to show up on CNN. And, and I'm like, get out of here. Like I was in disbelief. And then all of a sudden there it is on the news. Paul Walker dies in a car crash a day after this rumor had started to spread. Wow. Um, you know, he started out in soaps. He gained fame in She's All That and Varsity Blues, which both came out in 1999. Uh, the first Fast and Furious movie came out in uh, 2001. And uh, on November 30th, 2013, around 3.30 in the afternoon, a uh, 40-year-old Paul Walker and Roger Rodas, R-O-D-A-S, uh, 38, uh, left a charity event, uh, it was Paul Walker's charity, uh, driving a red 2005 Porsche Carrera GT. And there's a photo of them getting into that car as they're leaving the event. Uh, it's an industrial area, which I have since visited, and the speed limit in this industrial area is 45. Uh, evidence shows that the car reached near 100 miles an hour in a 45-mile-an-hour zone. And I just read today that uh, drifters would use that parcel of land to practice drifting. Uh, it's Hercules Street in Valencia, Santa Clarita, California. Uh, as he was zipping through this, and I don't know what Paul Walker, Paul Walker's in the, in the. I don't know if many people realize this. He's he was a in passenger. the passenger seat. Yeah. So I don't know what his reaction is to his friend doing 100 in this uh, 45 mile an hour. I don't know if he's egging him on or saying, hey, stop this, you're nuts. Um, but he lost control, hit a lamp post, two trees, burst into flames. There's a there's a, a security camera way off in the distance that caught the impact, and then you see black smoke rising in the distance. the The actual accident is kind of obscured, but you you see something happening right. in the black smoke in the distance. Um, the uh, Roger was was uh, as the medical reports say he he died instantly but there's there's a possibility that paul walker was still alive uh but unconscious and both of them were burned beyond recognition so he really died of the fire more than anything else um furious seven was still in production they hadn't finished filming it so they had to try to figure out what to do about furious seven uh they paused production and then uh, created a new ending where Paul Walker's brother completed uh, some scenes in the movie. Some stunts, And yeah. then they used some face mapping technology, and uh, with the permission of the family and everything, they finished the film. Uh, now, uh, my personal experience is uh, when Furious 7 was released, I happened to be in L.A. I got to see it at the famous Grauman's Chinese Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Nice. 
And there are scenes in the movie that are taking place in L.A. on the very streets outside of this movie theater. And I got goosebumps. It was so eerie to be there. And then at the end, when the when he pulls up along Vin Diesel and says, weren't you going to say goodbye? And then they have that helicopter shot where the cars go off in different directions. I wept openly. There oh. were other people in the theater with me. Oh, yeah. We all sure. cried together. Uh, I walk out in the sunlight, drying my tears, and I decided I was going to get in my car and go to the crash scene. So I drove to that industrial area, and it was very, very moving. There were probably about a dozen people there uh, leaving mementos. Uh, there were there were uh, crosses hanging from trees, and somebody had left a Sharpie, and the curb was was full of comments and well-wishers and stuff like that. So I took the Sharpie, uh, wrote something on the curb, and kind of sat there and took it all in with these strangers who were sharing this moment. And so Hmm. that's the personal experience that I had. And uh, I feel like the franchise was never quite the same after uh, he left. But uh, I I go and enjoy the movies whenever a new one comes out. But, uh, yeah, I was, uh, was, you know, as far as celebrity deaths go, that was – pretty tough on me and uh it's uh they reference him now brian's character in yeah he's movies. always they haven't killed him off in the movies yet he's always off camera taking care of his children or something like yeah, that so. what if in the next one they cgi him <laughs> well that you know <laughs> with this face mapping the deep fake technology they probably could bring in his brother who looks almost exactly like him and maybe do some mild face mapping to you know maybe bring it back but i think out of respect i don't think yeah, they would ever let, do yeah that, let it so. let it go yeah 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 so that was a that was a tragic loss and it, it just makes it that much harder knowing that he wasn't in control of the situation that yeah. somebody else had caused this accident but you know the the footnote is he he died doing what he loved he is driving fast he loved cars he loved going fast uh i had the honor a few years ago uh, I had heard that the uh, t- Toyota Supra from the fast, uh, first Fast and Furious movie was going up for auction. And as I read the article, I found out that the, the car that was going up for auction was here in Michigan. And so I reached out to a friend of mine. I said, uh, hey, do you know where this uh, Paul Walker Toyota Supra is? And he goes, I'm looking at it right now. I said, could I come see it? He said, yes, you can. Nice. So I drove out to Livonia, uh, went in. There was Paul Walker's orange Toyota Super from the first movie. Was it at This the, was after at, he had passed away. Is it at the the Roush uh, place? No, no, no. It was in a private collection. Oh, and yeah. uh, a mutual friend um, had owned it for a few years. And after Paul Walker's death, he decided to sell it. Mm. And so he had asked my friend Mel to hold on to it until the uh, auction so i got a chance to not only see it but sit in it and get my picture taken in it and then the uh the car went up for auction i think it sold for like a uh, hundred and ninety thousand dollars or something um and the guy uh regrets selling it he wishes he would have kept it i yeah. wish he would have kept it It would have been cool to have access to that car whenever i wanted um but that was another connection i had to paul walker was being able to sit in the car that uh he drove in the uh, very first fast and furious movie so yeah, on that note, anything to add before we wrap things up? I mean, we had a, you asked where people were when Princess Di passed away and all this stuff. And our local Michigan fan, who was a Red Wings fan, I thankfully it was not tragic when Vladimir Konstantinov and Sergei Vanessa's oh, yeah. limo accident happened right after they yeah. won the cup. After yeah, the years, Tracy were, Morgan had a similar accident. Yeah. yeah, people always remember like, oh my God, you know, because that was, that was a big defining moment for the, you know, but yeah. thankfully it ended up being tragic. I hope I'm doing this right. I want to end on this note. Well, Gig, I think I'd better take off. Oh, wait a minute, Jimmy. Um, one more question. Do you have any special advice for the young people who drive? Take it easy driving. The life you might save might be mine. You know? <laughs> James Dean.